Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our session on food safety with our new facilitator, Miss Theodora Morel. So I'll allow her to introduce herself and tell, her a little, and tell you guys a little bit about the course, and then we can begin. So Theo, you can go ahead. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Hope everybody's doing okay. Um, let me just clarify, I'm having some work down downstairs. The workers will be finished in a minute, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem. But if you have some noise, hopefully it won't be too distracting. Um, thank you for interacting with us in the chat today, for those of you who were in early. I'm hoping that we can use the chat and make it an active participant. So today we're not going to be teaching, we are going to be communicating and interacting. And I have been listening on some of your sessions. I know you guys are a lively group, very active, very informed. So I'm hoping that will continue. A little bit about me, my name is Theodora Morel, but I only get called Theodora when I'm in trouble. So if you call me Theodora, it's gonna make, make me think I'm in trouble. So you can use Theo. And whatever you do, don't call me Miss Morel because that makes me feel old, even though I'm retired. So I am from St. Lucia originally. Uh, I went to school in St. Lucia, did all my schooling in St. Lucia, then migrated to the US and did my education in the US. I actually live in New York right now, but I've traveled the world teaching food safety. My latest job was as vice president of global quality for Kellogg, the cereal company, but we make more than cereal. Um, and Kellogg has facilities all over the world, literally all over the world, which gave me an opportunity to learn different cultures, see different food safety practices across the globe. Um, developed and underdeveloped from Russia to Egypt to Brazil. So I retired a few right before the pandemic, which foresight is 2020. That was a good thing. Um, and during my course of food safety, I've worked in developed countries and underdeveloped countries. However, one of the things that I find lacking is in the developed countries, that's where we set the policies, the ISO policies, the standard. And for the majority of the time, the underdeveloped countries that have to apply or implement those policies are not part of the decision-making. So during my retirement, one of the things I wanna do is to be able to work with the West Indies, St. Lucia, St. Kitts, Nevis, St. Benson, and help with our local teams in agriculture and promote food safety. So I'm looking forward to today and tomorrow to have a good interaction with us. Okay. I am going to keep my camera off simply because I don't want to be distracted by looking at myself or pulling my hair. And then when I come back, I'll put it back on again. Hope that's okay with you ladies. So let me hear a hoo hoo make sure everybody's on. Can I hear some noise? Hola, hola. Hola, hola. All right, good. <laughs> Thank you, guys. It's really hard to do a virtual when you can't see people, but I know this group don't have a problem with that, and we'll get around it. OK, thank you, Joyce. All right, um, Lenelle is going to do the slides for us. Um, again, use your chat, Kellogg's, yes. Um, use your chat. I'll try to catch through some of them and Linnell will help me, but we will get started. All right, we can keep going. So today we are going to, for the first part, we're gonna do introduction, which we took already. Um, I know you guys, cause I sat into the intro. When I say I know you, I met 
you. I heard about your intro, so I know a little bit about you. I actually took notes, so I have some information on your background. Um, we'll talk about food safety culture. We'll talk about the basic principles of food safety. We'll talk about foodborne illness and microorganisms. Then we'll talk about kitchen and personal hygiene. And we'll talk about a little test at the end and somewhere in between. And we'll do it in a game format. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen the, um, the game Jeopardy. So I've prepared a Jeopardy, food safety Jeopardy for us to test our knowledge back and forth. Now, before I go, I would like to get two volunteers that could do a recap of the sessions. I know you've been doing that. And so you can do the recap in a couple of ways. You can do a case study by simply telling me about foodborne illness that you've had and based on what you understand in the feedback, what do you think you had? So be creative about it, or you can just do it straight. And it doesn't have to be that long, just a few, uh, a few minutes. Any question on the agenda? Okay. And the other thing is, it's okay to interrupt and ask questions in between. You don't have to wait till the end. I'm okay with asking in between, because again, it's an interaction. Okay, so what are your learning objectives? So this is the objectives I think we will be able to take away from here is again, what is food safety culture? It's role in producing safe food. What are the main food safety hazards, microorganisms and foodborne pathogens and what are they? Why kitchen and personal hygiene is a precursor to farm food safety and its role in producing safe food and how to use tools in your kitchen to prevent foodborne illness. Um, by the way, sometimes I have been told like speak really fast. So if I'm going too fast, raise your hands and I'll re remind me to slow down. <laughs> okay, so I have a little quiz for you to get us started. So who can be the first to unlock this phrase? I can be the first one, Marcino. Be the first person to unlock the puzzle. The phrase that I have there in the numbers, what does it mean? Can you unlock it into a phrase? One, nine, one, six, five. You have to translate it into a phrase. Is the first one food? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Well, no. So it's alphabet. Use the alphabet. Oh. You should so take a few things. minutes and use the alphabet to translate it into a phrase. Food safety is key. The first one is not safe food, um, something safe That's food, uh, and then S, what's before S? F R A, uh, what's S -R -A. Safe food, we're getting there. Safe food, S R A. Safe food starts with you. No, no, you missed it. So you have the first view. Safe food starts with, with you. No, it can't be no. you. 20. With the. the. Very good. And if the clue is all of us are here for that reason. We are all learning. No. You can farmer. Really solve it. You don't have to. Farmer. The farmer. Fair food starts with yeah. the farmer. Fair <laughs> food starts with the farmer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the clue was there is to know it's the alphabet and then turn the alphabet, uh, the numericals into alphabet. Say food starts with the farmer. So you guys, this is a very important statement. Because as farmers, whether you are doing food at home or food to sell, you are the first line of defense. 
the buck stops with you. So you have, we as farmers have to do our role to make sure that we are making money when we sell food. But the most important thing is we are not doing any harm. So I like to say we do no harm, whether you're in farming, in production, in selling across the chain, we are not doing food to harm. We are making the food to help um, for nutritious, and for safe food. So nobody wants, we don't want our families to get sick, nor do we want our consumers to get sick. So that's why I started the first day to start with at home and make it personal. And for some of you, it might be basic, but I think um, for the time that we have, we can start there. If it's getting too basic for you, you can challenge me and then we can up it up a little bit, okay? Okay, food safety culture. So what is food safety culture? What's a culture? What are some examples? When, I, when you hear the word culture, what comes to mind? What, do you, what would you say is a culture for your region, for your place, for the Caribbean? What is some cultures that you would say we have? Uh, you can either put your hands up and we'll call you or you can speak up. Norms and practices. Thank you, Joyce. Anybody else? Give me some of Joyce. Can you give me some of the norms and practices that we call culture in the Caribbean or in your, at home? Saint Kitts Nevis. What what is one of the norms and cultures of Saint Kitts Nevis? Joyce. The way we cook and speak and interact, yes. The style of food exactly. Okay, I'm sorry. Style. Okay, um, yes. Um, our norms and culture are, they're shaped differently. It is um, about our way of living, our way of interacting, the way we eat, the way we hear our food. It's just the way we behave on a day-to-day -day basis. Exactly. Basis. So a culture is something that you just do, right? because it's your way of life. It's how it comes naturally to you. Nobody don't have to tell you to do it. It's just something you do. Go ahead. Was somebody trying to say something? Okay. So you get it. It's a culture, it's something we do. So food safety culture is not any different. So um, let me, if you could go to the next few slides. So here's some cultures I think for the Caribbean that we have. One is carnival. Right? We all believe in carnival, that's our way of living. We have the drums, we have fishing villages, we wear uniforms to school, we are a Christian nation, and we love the beach. Most of us love the beach. I don't, I think when we think of our Caribbean, we think of beaches, right? So those are some of the cultures we have in the Caribbean that's unique to us. And like I was saying, it's a norm, it's a, a way of living. And we don't even think about it, it's just there. So would you say food safety on the farm, at home, in the restaurant for our Caribbean nation, for St. Kitts Nevis, would you say right now food safety is, uh, food safety culture is a norm, a practice that we follow on a regular basis? And you can do that by um, the chat, Yes, no, or you can stick it up. I, I wanted to get your feedback on that one. So the question is, is food safety culture a practice that is a norm in St. Kitts Nevis or for the broader Caribbean? When we prepare food, when we do at home, on the farm, everywhere. Somebody said yes. Anybody else have a different point of view? Glenisa said yes, Joyce said yes. Anybody says no? That food safety is a culture that we have in everything we do. Okay, so I have a different point of view. I think when I learn, and we'll talk about it, it's very important, yes. It's becoming more popular, yes. Lorraine and Nadia, it's most times, 
um, Carol said it's very important. So I, as I've traveled around the Caribbean and the other developing countries, yes, we are aware of it, but we don't always follow all the practices that we know. We are a nation of the Caribbean. We are a clean nation. We believe in cleanliness, but we have a lot of practices that we have to enhance and increase our um, food safety culture. Especially if we're selling food by the way, by the roadside, we make food. Everybody is an entrepreneur, so it's more it's more lacking in those areas, and probably a little bit more predominant uh, um, in more retail establishment. Even though, if you look, hopefully after today, you keep looking and see there's a lot of opportunities. So we are getting there. We need to do more so than we are right now. So food, go ahead to the next one, Linnell. So food safety culture, it goes beyond policies and scientific knowledge. So it's not about what the science says. It's not about the policies that we have, because in some cases we have the policies, but we don't use them. It's a behavior and a mindset, like you guys talked about earlier. It's how you behave, it's the mindset. And it has to be from everybody. So if you have a farm, you have to walk the walk and talk the talk. So if you have a farm and you have employees, you need to be demonstrating that food safety is important. You need to demonstrate that you wash your hands at all times. You need to provide tools for your employees to wash hands. At home, if you want your kids to follow food safety, you have to do it. So if you see it, then you can behave it. So it's not enough for us to just talk about it or have a policy on it. When you have a true food safety culture, you're doing the right thing just because, not because you have a policy. So you won't pick up the fruits of the floor and put it in a cart if somebody's not watching. You will know, okay, this fruit is there. I have to wash it before I put it into someplace else. Or I can't put the manure from one side to the other. It's a practice of what you need to do. So I wanted to start with the food safety culture because if that culture does not exist, it'll be really, really hard for us to think that food safety is important. So when you think about, you talked about finances and you talk about sustainability, I want all of you to take the courses as not separate one, but they all intertwine. And hopefully you will see that as you go through the cases. So when you do your business plan, a key component of your business plan is to show your food safety policies and procedures that your food is wholesome. So whoever you're selling it to can take that as a competitive advantage, okay? going. So again, I said we're going to be interactive. So by in your chat, put the right. So which statement does not reflect a food safety culture? A, B, C, or D? Use your chat buttons if you can. Kirania said C, Linnell said C, sorry if I'm butchering up your name. Carice said C, Carol said C. Anybody else with a different answer? Yeah, I think C. C, yeah. So. This, this group is great. It is C, so it is C, yes. Hand washing is not necessary on the farm because we are always handling it. So we, it's always important for us to wash our hands. And you'll see, and you already know that maybe that hands are the number one um, source of contamination. I'm excited to see that nobody picked D. In the other courses, some people pick D, raw manure is not used during harvesting. So that's really good that nobody picked that. Okay, next. 
So what is food safety? Food safety in words is actually very simple. Food safety refers to the handling, preparing, storing of food in a way to best reduce the risk of people getting sick from foodborne illness. So when you think about food safety and you'll hear about it during this course and then tomorrow when we talk about farming, it is simply down. It's handling how you handle it, how you prepare it and how you store it. Next one. And there's four steps to ensure that we keep food safe. We have to clean, separate, to make sure we don't have cross-contamination. Cooking kills bacteria. Separating it prevents it from getting from one place to the other. Chilling will stop the growth of most bacteria. It won't kill it, but it will stop it, except for listeria, which we'll talk about when we go. Clean does not kill a bacteria. Clean will remove the dirt from your hands, but it doesn't clean it. You need to sanitize to kill bacteria or you need to cook. Okay. So when we talk about food safety in terms of food safety and home on in the farm, food safety is classified in three categories. You have microbial, which is microorganisms, including bacteria, mold, yeast, viruses. And we'll talk a lot about that. And then you have the physical, which is, it's not microbial, but it will harm you. It will cut like um, broken glass, cherries. I'm interested if anybody can tell me why is cherries a physical hazard? Can anybody take a guess at why cherries is a physical hazard? A little child might choke on it. I don't know. A choking is one. Um, what else? So if an adult, what would, why would be a, a hazard, a physical hazard for an adult? Um, maybe when you bite on them and not remove the pits, you yes, could damage the, the pits. It causes a lot of dental problems. So if you have cherries and if people are putting cherries, although it's not a microbial and it's part of your food, when you think about those pits, they can call dentures. And in small children, for sure, choking. And then you have chemical. So bleach, pesticide, and in some cases we put allergens in there because it's the interaction. And we talk a little bit about allergen, but allergen would be in that category of chemical hazard. But for today, we're gonna focus a lot about biological because that's the one that's more prevalent when we talk about foodborne illness. We'll touch a little bit about some of the examples of physical and we'll touch a little bit about allergen, but because of time, we'll focus mostly on microbial. Okay, so let's talk about foodborne illness. By a show of hands, in the chat room, how many people have experienced foodborne illness once, or you think you did, or maybe thought you did? Anybody? You can either raise your hands or put in the chat yes or no. I've had experience foodborne illness. Marina has the hands up. I can put hands up my hands up twice because I've had it multiple times. Anybody else? Um I I do believe that almost all of us would have had some foodborne illness because sometimes we just vomit and just said okay whatever but it could have been foods that were not prepared properly or basic thing but I think generally most of us would have might have had Food po uh, poison. Mm -hmm. I think you are right because most of the time we're not aware that it is. And most of the time when we get food poisoning, what do we do? We blame the food we just ate, which is most of the time not the case because it takes a little bit of time to get foodborne illness. We go to the last food we eat and sometimes that's not always the case. So let's go and find out a little bit more about that. 
So I'll show you a little video that Lanelle's gonna play to give you a little place to start. This video is a little Oh, wrong one again, Lamel. Lamel, that's the wrong one. You have the other one ready? Yes, it's ready. Sorry for the confusion. Don't worry about it. This one is just a little bit about what you already know, but bring it up to a visual point of why food safety is important and mostly about hand washing and how you feel about it. Some of you may have seen the TV show Seinfeld. It's not on again, but this one is from a clip in Seinfeld. And I thought it was appropriate for us to watch it. I'm going to the bathroom. <laughs> I'm going to the bathroom. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> ha ha ha, Jerry. <laughs> Tonight you're in it for a real treat. And I'm personally going to prepare the dinner for you and the Maiodri. see what did you see in that video i'm really looking forward to this duck i've never had food anyone he didn't wash his hands yes um Zidi didn't wash his hands and then what happened though why is that a problem because the food he made pizza and he cooked the pizza and we said cooking kills everything so why was that the problem that he didn't wash his hands Cross-contamination, Zadia, yes. Cross-contamination. And again, it's just disgusting, right? You don't want somebody to go into the bathroom and handle your food. Yes, Irina, just yuck. So imagine that when you're at home and when you go out, you don't want to be the person that's preparing food, even though people are not watching, mm -hmm. that you're not washing your hands. There's so, so many times I go and I'm traveling in the airport and I see people come in and they don't wash their hands, they just leave the bathroom. At my own risk, I will say, hey, did you forget something? <laughs> but I don't recommend that you do that because people might not be too happy, but we too many times forget to wash our hands. Okay, thank you. That's just nasty, yes. It's just disgusting and bacteria, you need time and temperature. So it's just not good hygienic practices. And that's not, it's, it happened to be in the movies in a, a little clip, but that happens in real life. I know a lot of you have seen that. Okay, food poisoning. 
So we said the number one of the one cause of food poisoning is the improper cooking and storage, but poor hygiene comes in second. And then people at the highest risk of dying from food poisoning are the young ones and the um, children and elderly and anybody that has um, become in, that's in, uh, touches hair without washing his hands also. Yes, Louise, that's a great point. All right. Keep going. So I'm gonna give you the symptoms and not everybody will have those symptoms, but those are the four major symptoms. So the first one is, keep going. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Now, in some cases, based on what you have, you get what I call, or what's commonly called the two bucket disease. The two bucket disease may, means you're going at both ends. Most people who get foodborne illness, the healthy people, will, it will not kill you. It just make you wish you were dead by the time it's done with you. I got foodborne illness in Mexico one time and I was going through a plantar and I, was so careful, but they had tamarind balls. And I was excited because I saw the tamarind balls. And I figured, ah, it's not gonna be too, too much of a problem. I forgot the handling and the bad water. Boy, did I get sick. And I had to walk through the, the plant. So I had to exit the plant. And that one was a two bucket disease. And I had to travel, so that was not good. So it doesn't kill you, it just makes you wish you were dead, okay? So foodborne illness globally, unfortunately, it's still climbing. This is data from the World Health Organization. Annually, over 6 million people will get foodborne illness each year. Unsafe food causes um, disease. And next slide, about 420,000 deaths. Unfortunately, 30% of the death occur in children. And that's in developed and undeveloped world as well. Um, this number is expected to climb. And that's after we've done so much to prevent foodborne illness. And you can imagine in this day and age, it's still that much. And that is only the ones that's reported. It doesn't take into account the one that's not reported. In developing countries, they have ways of quickly identifying the source and reporting it. In the underdeveloped countries, those numbers go on um, reported. Next slide. Next one. So I, can you guess? what that number is for the Caribbean. Can anybody take a guess? Is that higher, lower, an estimate? I mean, generally speaking. I think it's lower. It's lower, um, like how low? Um, I'm not sure, but I think Caribbean people generally, generally um, more um, handle food cleaner than Maybe about um, 2,000? About 2,000, yeah. So I want to address that, that, that myth. We hardly do statistics. But today I hit it right on the head. On the head sorry. Um, go to the next slide, Lenelle. Oh. Um, yeah, go ahead. On the news today, they were, um, they were recalling some, some baby food. Yes. Because they were contaminated in salmonella or something. Salmonella and, and, and some of those foods are probably, um, baby foods are probably here. Similac, I think. Right. Uh, yeah, it was Similac and it was corona, um, corona, uh, salmonella. I had, I think, um, what was the other back? Coronabacter, which is a spore that is typical in food, baby food manufacturing and baby food manufacturing in a developed country is so highly regulated. However, once in a while you get pathogens in there and you are touching the highest risk one. So I'm, 
I'm glad that you guys heard it in the Caribbean because one of the problems we have is when we have recalls, especially in the developed countries, unfortunately, too many times I see that recall food on the shelf or the news um, release doesn't get to the Caribbean. So I'm surprised that you guys already have it, which is good news, but that is not typically the case. Yeah, so I have a question. Do you have the figures for the Eastern Caribbean? Because I don't know, it, does does that Caribbean include Latin America? Or, and yes, like, so it, it, that is including Latin America. It's from the um, CARICOM nation. It includes um, all the Latin America countries. So, so this there's is, no data for the Eastern wow. Caribbean? Because I'm thinking the Eastern Caribbean might be even lower. Because sometimes when you add, I don't mean to call them the Latin American places, but Sometimes when you add Latin America and Haiti and, you know, places that have issue with, with clean water supply, it might. Yeah, um, that's true. But I'm sure because and I, when I was talking to CAFTA and the other agencies in the Caribbean, we don't have a good way to track and to monitor foodborne illness. So those numbers are way, 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 way lower than it is because we are not monitoring it. And I know we are a clean nation, but I know if we start tracking and monitoring it, we will find that number going higher because the time we feel we just have a little bellyache or we just have a little something, something or a little cold, majority of time it becomes foodborne illness, but it goes underreported. So I hear you about the, the water because I know in Mexico you get you just look at the water and you get sick. <laughs> but we can't take ourselves out of that. If you're in your home, it's fine. But if you're eating outside and all those other things, you go on the fair outside and people are preparing food, but there's no toilet or no bathroom. We use the outside, you know, there's no hand wash, hand washing stations. And if we use gloves, we're not using it properly. So I think the numbers are underreported. And because we don't have enough of a technology, she tells me she's working on with CDC to do some um, football reporting and tooling. We're getting there, but we're not there yet. The recall was sent out by the chief medical officer office. That's very good. Is that normally how you get recalls? Recall notice? Is that's pretty good. Yes. Okay. Good. Next slide, let me have a kid. We'll speak through a little bit of those. So microorganisms, uh, keep going. So when I look at microorganism, I talk about it in the good, the bad, the ugly. So you'll hear people talk about it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So not all microorganisms are bad. So we have the good ones, which is the ones that we use in our gut. We are humans and we have bacteria all inside of us. So those that is good for our gut health, in the yogurt, probiotics, they make medicine for the mold, in the cheese and processing, and in my favorite, wine and the pitons. So all of those without the good microorganisms, we, we won't be able to enjoy that. And I'm sure you can think of some other good ways where we have good microorganisms. And then we have the bad microorganisms. The bad microorganisms, they make the food look bad. They make the food taste bad. So the milk will taste sour. The um, moldy bread might be yucky. And you can cut out some of that mold and still be okay with it. The sour milk will just make you feel you want to throw up, but it won't make you sick, right? The mangoes, the rotten end of the mangoes, those are not bacteria that's gonna make you sick. The good news is you'll be able to see it. But when we talk about the bad or the dangerous microorganisms, those are the ones we have to worry about because they most of 100% of the time, they're not gonna make you sick. They will make, not change the food. So the food will look fine. It might not smell. And when you eat it, you will not know that it's um, contaminated. So we'll talk about Listeria, Salmonella, and a few of those others. Listeria is a new organism in terms, it, I mean, I say new, I mean, it's not 500 years old. It just came in the last uh, decade or so, became a problem. Next slide. Did somebody have, Joyce, did you have your hands up? Oh, that's from before. 
Is there some hands up, Joyce? Lorraine? I have sorry, my hands sorry, up. Sorry, that was from before. Okay. That was from before, sorry. Lorraine, you have Lorraine Lawrence? Yes, I have a, a question to ask. So I remember um, years ago, I did a biology experiment on bread mm -hmm. and it was not getting any mold at all. So mm -hmm. I was kind of wondering, so I, I did I did it with various type of bread, but there was one particular bread, I'm not going to say who it's from, but one particular bread was not like getting any mold or anything on it. You know what the reason for that is? Um, I can take a guess because sometimes when you use bread, you the, the yeast that you use in the bread, if the yeast is still active, it can act as a natural preservative. Is the oh, only reason okay. I think would get mold? Or did you put the same moisture and same condition in all of them? Yes, and only uh only they were only two other brands that I use got mold on them. That particular one was not getting mold at all. It was just getting hard. Um, did they have a preservative in it? Um, well, I bought it from somewhere, so I guess they had some type of preservative. Yeah. But and somebody will, if you look at the label, they will use some um, benzoate sorbate, a little bit of it to prevent it from getting moldy. So if you find your bread not getting moldy, it's either because it has some level of benzoate or sorbate in it, or you have some action and which is the less likely if it has a lot of yeast baked into it the yeast can act as a preservative at a low level but i would check to make sure it didn't have any preservatives on it so the bread and saying kids don't have on labels at least not the locally made ones yeah so the locally made bread should go moldy fast because there's nothing in them it's just fresh bread and if you leave them out they get hard and they, they should be moldy, but again. That bread that I had was locally made because it was all locally made bread, but for some reason it was not molding and I put it in the same conditions as the other two breads that I use from the, a different um, bakery. Mm -hmm. So I just don't know what was going on that time. So maybe the ingredients, so it could be also the grain that they use, the flour had something in it some self-rising flour has some preservatives. So something must have been in it that was inhibiting the growth of the mold. I, that's the only thing I can think of. I've baked bread and it, it, to me, it lasts longer outside than the bread I buy in the store. That could be too, because you have less spores probably. Because remember mold the spores and they're everywhere and the spores then germinate. Anything you do at home is safer, rule of thumb. Because you are taking a question with it. All right, so let's go through um, the leading cause of food poisoning. It's raw, uh, it's called Campylobacter. And the source of it is eating or coming in contact with raw chicken or undercooked chicken or eggs. So you will see a lot of, um, keep going, Lynette. You're washing your hands and your surface is a preventive for cross contamination. Use hot water and soap, or better yet, you can use diluted solution, bleach solution. Remember, I said washing does not kill bacteria. If you think of anything else, remember that washing takes the dirt and things off your hands. But for you to really eliminate the bacteria off your hands, it has to be sanitized. The hot bleach will take away a lot of the stuff on your hands, but if you have bacteria on them, it will not eliminate, it will not kill it. Okay. Now on chicken, we do a lot of, I don't know for some kids, so I can't speak for some kids, but a common culture is to defrost our chicken on the countertop and let it stay there and we let it stay out for a long time. That's a culture that prevents, that promotes a lot of rapid growth and causes cross-contamination. The other thing which I mentioned earlier and everybody goes, think I'm crazy because the recommendation is that we should not wash our raw meat and raw chicken. You just cook it. And I know a lot of you are thinking that's disgusting. 
But the reason for that is when you wash chicken, especially if you have it sitting outside and it's loaded with bacteria, it's very hard to prevent the raw chicken from spreading bacteria around, in and around the surrounding area. So you can wash the chicken, and then tell me you're gonna clean and sanitize it when you finish. But we've done studies where you see the splatter of where chicken juice can go. It goes so far out and then unsuspectingly, you have cross-contaminated something. So I know even in my own house, every day I get chills when I tell people to put the food in the refrigerator and then they look, laugh at me. My grandmother, when I went back and I told her that, she said, child, go find yourself a sick. You've done it that long, it hasn't killed you. But we have to learn and change things. So let's go to the next one. Oh. Salmonella again, we said salmonella, you might all heard about salmonella and chicken. You can't find a raw chicken that doesn't have salmonella. It's the second leading cause of foodborne illness. And it's from eating undercooked food such as eggs or chicken. Now, the good thing about us in the Caribbean, we cook the heck out of everything. And I know St. Kitts Nevis is not any different because we cook everything to death. Nobody eating anything medium raw. And our culture is if the chicken is pink, we don't eat it. However, the bigger problem for us is the cross contamination. Okay. Now, there's I, a cookie dough, when we make cookies, and I don't know how much we do a lot of it in St. Kitts, but if you are making cookie dough and you put raw eggs in it, if you eat that cookie dough, you can get sick. And there's a number of recalls happening around the world because cookie dough is a problem for salmonella. A lot of people, when they make the cake, they lick the pots, they lick the pan, that lick might be your last because it can make you very, very sick. Okay. Next. Okay, keep going. E. coli. So E. coli is another organism that you can find it in ground beef. Now, when you see E. coli, you have to think poop. Because feces is the number one source of E. coli from humans and from animals. So there's a lot of outbreaks of E. coli. You might be hearing about it in, in the developing countries, the US, in produce and fresh vegetables from Mexico, from um, US, Europe with E. coli in it. And that's because where the farms are, they either have animal farms or they have um, workers that don't wash their hands or the water is contaminated, which causes a big problem. So E. coli is another source of foodborne illness. And in E. coli and kids, and we'll show you a video tomorrow where it impacts your kidney and oh my God, it's so deadly. It's really, really bad. So you wanna make sure you wash your hands. It's as easy as keeping our hands washed and clean and preventing cross-contamination. Again. All right, we talked about all of those. Again, remember cooking, 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 cooking. Don't eat raw hamburgers when you eat your food. Instead, we can eat steak raw in the middle because the, the steak on the inside is sterile. It's the outside. If you want to be dangerous and eat steak raw, medium raw, you can do that. Um, oysters and all of those, stay away from it. You will not find me eating anything raw or oyst raw oysters or any of those. Okay. Listeria. How many of you have heard of Listeria monocytogenes? Show of hands. Anybody has heard of Listeria? No? Well, Listeria is an organism that's unique in that it grows at refrigerated temperature. Remember I said the refrigerator will stop growth. 
but listeria will grow in refrigeration. It will grow in ice cream, it will grow in cheeses. Um, if you have list, the listeriosis is raw milk, soft cheese, cold cuts at the deli meats and the deli meats because when they slice the meat, if you go to the supermarket and they're slicing the meat, they don't clean the slices properly because the slices have areas, nooks and crannies where you can get contamination and sprout. When I go out to eat and they have sprout on my food, you know, those little decoration they put on your food, make sure you don't put that. I always say they sprinkle it with salmonella, listeria, and a little bit of E. coli. So I don't use those. But listeria is critical in that it affects pregnant women. Um, keep going, Lanelle, the other slide, the other one. No, go back. It causes, um, it leads to fetal death or preterm labor. So pregnant women who consume raw milk, soft cheeses, cold cuts or sprout is at risk of causing fetal death or preterm labor. So if you know of anybody who's pregnant, if you're pregnant, you wanna take stay away from that. Okay, next one, botulism. So a lot of you heard about botulism. Botulism is uh, intoxication in that it provides a toxin. That toxin is so dangerous. They said, if you put a spoonful of toxin in the New York City water supply, you can get a lot of people sick. It will cause paralysis. And you may have heard a lot of the actors and actresses uses Botox, which what they're actually doing is taking a version of the botulism toxin and injecting it into their face. So it paralyzes their face and get rid of wrinkles. That's why you always see some of them, sometimes their face is disfigured is because something went wrong and the toxin, a little too much toxin. But for us, we have to worry about in the Caribbean in canning and in canning, if you see the dented cans or the bulging cans, make sure don't taste it, don't make anybody else taste it because the botulism can grow in it and it doesn't need air for it to grow like most bacteria. So it'll get a little pinhole, it gets either the juice dries on it and then the organism grows in there, provides the toxin. And it's fair, this one is dangerous because it causes paralysis. The good news is it's not very common anymore, but because the canning regs have changed, but if you are doing home canning, that's where the number one problem comes from um, botulism. You can control it if your product has a pH below 4.6. So if you have acidic juices, then it doesn't grow well in there, okay? When in doubt, throw out. Never use food from bulging cans. You can click, uh, keep clicking. Avoid deeply dented cans, discard food. You know, when you go to the supermarket sometimes, you see a bin with dented cans on discount. Be very careful about those because those cans could be a um, source of botulism. Okay. Someone taste the food. Infant botulism, and I brought that in again because if you, it's a common thing for infant. If you are using honey, try not to give infants from zero to one year. Some people will take honey and put it on teething baby's mouth to help. That's a bad thing to do. This is not a foodborne illness. It's an intoxication because the babies inside are so new, they cannot digest the spores as grownups. If we add, eat it, it's, the spores just in our food is not gonna be a problem. But when the infants take it in, they cannot colonize it. So it creates the toxin and cause death. Hopefully it's not a common practice. Um, Louise said, I read in a food group that garlic stored in, yes, yes, yes. Garlic stored in oil could be a prime source of contamination. Yes, because what that's happening is the garlic has the spores, the oil forms the surface, 
and it creates what we call an anaerobic condition. So all the oxygen is driven from there and it causes the, uh, the spores to germinate and produce the toxin. That's a main source. So if we are doing that in the Caribbean, that's a good point, thank you. When you have your garlic and oil, keep it refrigerated because it's a major source. Thank you for calling that out. Okay, keep going. And staff aureus, again, we all have staff on us, whether we are clean or dirty. Staff is on our hands, it's in our nose and our mouth. You hear your mother say, don't dig your nose. Again, it's not just the truth, it's staph. And staph is one of the organisms by itself doesn't make you sick. It's an intoxication in that you are taking in this, the organism. It has to grow inside of you. It produces toxin. And that toxin cannot be killed by retard or by temperature. You cannot kill staph toxin. Once you have it, it's a problem. Also with staph, if you have a, a sore, it's called a flesh eating disease. You may have heard about that. That's, that's what's causing that staph. And those staph are very resistant to antibiotics. So you can't do a lot about it. So be careful to wash your hands, wash your hands about that. All right. I think that's it for the key microorganism that we wanna cover. Now that's not all, but based on time, we wanted to say what are the key ones that's associated with foodborne poisoning. And there is no cure for foodborne, so food poisoning, true or false? True or false, there's no cure for foodborne illness. You can speak or you can put it in the chat. Anybody wants to take a guess? Uh, no, it's about true. True. Know, five people was in the Yeah. There's no cure for foodborne illness. Somebody say then, why do we go to the doctor? Because once you get foodborne illness, there's nothing you can do about it. It gets dehydrated. You can treat the symptoms. So, Lanel, you can put the next slide on. Now. We have to drink a lot of fluid to flush it out, right? Consult if the symptom becomes severe or lasts longer than 12 hours because they can give you um, they can give you fluid or they can, if you have a fever, they can give you something for the fever, but they can only help treat the symptoms. Do not induce vomiting. By the time you actually feel sick, the poison is past your stomach. So you cannot do a lot about it. And then the other thing, we, if you do and we, you get food poisoning, try not to take pepto because all it's gonna do, it's delayed. So the vomiting will stop, but the minute you stop taking it, you're gonna start again. So try not to take that, but just keep hydrated, okay? So let's touch quickly on some examples of physical hazard. And that's not so much as in the home, but if you have a restaurant, if you have a manufacturing plant, and when you go to the factory, those are the things you wanna stay away from. Stones, stems, seeds, hair. That's why a lot of people wear hair net and nobody wants to see a piece of hair in their food. Feathers, jewelry, I think people like to see jewelry and get a price, but they don't wanna see it in their food. The nails, the lashes, bolts, nails, strings, buttons. So some of those things that we need to make sure that when we go to our farm or when we prepare food, that we are preventing those. The next one we want to talk about is allergens. Now, food allergy is a big, big problem. However, I, I hear that in Caribbean, we don't worry about that. But peanut is the number one food allergy globally. I have a niece and nephew. They are both allergic to peanuts. There was one time um, somebody came to their house and they were eating peanuts and they kissed her on the cheek and she had a major reaction to it. 
So food allergy is the number one cause of foodborne illness in the developing countries, again, because it's being reported. Um, seafood allergy is another big one. And then you have sensitivity, which is your body reacts to it. But food allergies, I don't see a lot of programs in the Caribbean on it. It's getting there, but not so much. And when I look at foodborne mani um, food manufacturers in the Caribbean, there's not a lot of programs around managing allergens. If you travel, you'll hear that they ban peanuts on the plane. So most um, flights will not offer peanuts and that's because it's so dangerous. So there's a whole section on food allergies. If you have questions, we can touch into it. If that's something that you want to deal with on your farm, I can help you control it. But if, again, for this one, because of timing, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Okay. Any questions so far? All right, so if you don't have a question, we'll play a little Jeopardy game. And I promise those are very, very easy. And I know this group is a really smart group. So it'll be a piece of cake. So don't be afraid to pick one. So like Jeopardy, you're gonna, I'm gonna give you a clue, a category. You're gonna pick um, a category, um, the amount will show you a question and you have to give me, we'll show you a statement and you'll give me the, the question that goes with the statement. And we'll do the first one. So let me click on microorganism from 100. Leaving things that are too small to be seen with the naked eyes. So your answer would be, what are microorganisms? We got it? Good, so who wants to go next? I can go. What do you want, Jacqueline? I hope I, I hope I know the answer. It doesn't matter. It was a game. <laughs> um, I'll go with kitchen hygiene for 300. Kitchen hygiene for 300. We haven't touched kitchen hygiene yet, so that's good, but you guys should already probably know that. One of the best ways to remove germs, avoid getting sick and spreading germs. What's your, what do you think it is? Um, what is washing your hands? Close, keep going. There you go. What is hand washing? All right, who wants to go next? I'll go. All right. The Sharis? I uh, I'll do personal hygiene for 500. All right. They're not hard. Daily. <laughs> what is washing your hands? <laughs> no, it's not washing your hands. What is you taking a bath? More than this. What is taking a shower? Yes. All right. You guys are good. What is the frequency of taking a shower? Okay, let's do one more because I'm running out of time, and that's going to be available for you to play with if you um in your 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 chat room. Let's do one more. Oh, and you see how easy it was. Okay. Can I can I have yes. foodborne illnesses for 200? Foodborne illness for 200. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain. You got that, Joyce. Um, what is food poisoning? Ah, no. <laughs> What are the symptoms? What are the four main symptoms? Oh, but it's the symptoms of food poisoning, of food poisoning. Very good, guys. Good job. So again, this is there for you to uh, check your, your knowledge. And I'll come back again with it time for meeting as we go through it as a good way to check your knowledge. Thank you. So now we, we've done the bacteria, we've done the symptoms, we'll go quickly into the home hygiene and for the rest of the next 45 minutes, try to cover hygiene. Now I'll try to go a little faster from time. So here's a picture of you. I want you to 
tell me in numbers how many issues you can identify. When you identify, put your number in the chat room. So how, put type in how many um, issues you see. Somebody has seven, five. Wow, Clarissa has 10, Arena has six. Okay, anybody else? Wanna put something in? Okay, so let's go through and see what they have and see who's correct. Um, the first one, wait, don't pull all together. <laughs> all right, it's okay, we have six. So it's the six that we have that I called out was the roach, the dirty sponge, the raw meat and the produce, together for cross-contamination, the dirty dishes, the garbage can, it's overflowing and it's open and it's in the middle of the kitchen. And then you have the refrigerator looks broken because it's dripping stuff out of it. And then you have the roach. So I'm interested to know for the people who put 10 or more than six, what were the other ones you found? Well, I separated the vegetables, the fruits and the meat. I, I took that as two. Oh, okay, yes. All right, good. But the, the point here was they were touching, right? Okay. Okay, so, and if somebody said 10, um, what else? The green thing by the wall was one. Okay. Yeah, it looked like one, but it is just um, part of the graphic. All right. So good, good, you guys are really good. So those are the kind of things that we see. And the sponge that we have, a lot of us use sponge and cloth and we don't dry them. I use my sponge when I use it. I put it in the microwave for a few minutes every night. And then if I use um, other stuff, I'll put it in a dishwasher or something to sterilize it. But then I try to keep it dry. Um, when I'm using it because we touched without knowing that sponge is one of the biggest source of contamination that we spread it out. I have an exercise that I do with Glogerm and it will be amazed to see where the bacteria goes from a sponge. Okay, good job guys. So imagine this setting that you have, you go into a home or even a restaurant for that case, but this one is a home, you invite it, you sit down, you say your prayers, you eat. And then you go to the other side, next slide, and you decide to go to the bathroom or step out and you see this. Now remember you've eaten all that food and you see that, and I know a lot of us say that doesn't happen in the West Indies, but how many of you have gone back in the back of a restaurant and see what's back there? It can be really disgusting. So when we do our food in the farm, it's really important of how we prepare food and the conditions. So we are not preparing it in what we call adulterated position. Now, somebody called from the last session that they had a bottle of bleach, which is a good thing, but you can't sterilize dirt, right? There's not enough bleach to keep this clean. Okay, next slide. So I, for me, whenever I go out, <laughs> I always try to find a little look at the kitchen at the restaurant in the back and see what's going on there. Don't have to go in the back. Most times they bold the nasty. Yes, that is true, Lauren. Most times they bold and nasty. <laughs> but sometimes it's deceiving. All right, again, we wanna talk about the four steps to food safety. Clean, separate, cook, and chill. It sounds simple, but that's the key at home, in the restaurant, in your farm, in your um, agro-processing facility. Next slide. So clean, we'll talk a little bit about it. It sounds 
basic, but like when we claim keep going, you know, washing hands, work surface is the best way to prevent. Remember, I said you can take all of them. You cannot get rid of the bacteria once it's there unless you dilute it. So prevention, prevention, prevention. Wash hands, your surface, best way to prevent cross-contamination. Use hot water and soap or diluted bleach. Again, a little bit of bleach. You don't even smell it, but it goes a long way. Next slide. Separate, cross-contamination, the process by which bacteria are transferred. So those are the obvious ones. Remember I said, don't wash the chicken because it cross contamination. Cutting boards, we use a lot of cutting boards, right? And knives, how do we make sure that's not there? If when you go and I go out on the outside, the person will cook the same food they use on the chicken on the grill. Then they use that same fork to separate the cooked chicken from the raw chicken or the chicken on the grill is next to the raw. Um, and the other thing too is when you use money, we talk a lot about that. We handle money. Money is the dirtiest thing that is. And then we touch food or hot dog bread or whatever else. We don't cook the bread and then we can get foodborne illness. So separate, think about it, not just here, but outside when you go out and see what's happening and be very careful about that. And same thing when we, when we talk about in your plant. So we'll talk a little bit about that on the farm and a little bit about in your manufacturing facility. Okay, let's talk about cook. Now, this is a minimum temperature for you to cook. And I want, it's, this one is not clear at, on here, but I think when you get it on the slide, you will see it clearer. But this is a good chart for you to use at home or for you to use when you are processing. So you wanna keep food out of the danger zone. The danger zone is four degrees C to 60. So if you think about 60, 60 is just a little, it's not cold, but it's like room temperature, a little bit above room temperature. The bacteria are happy, 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 happy. And they will grow and multiply so fast. So that's why you can't defrost your chicken at, at room temperature. You cannot um, put high risk food at that temperature. You either keep hot food hot or cold food cold and don't cross contaminate. Okay, so keep if you keep anything, you can print that out and have it on your refrigerator or have it at your office. If you want a clearer one, if it doesn't show up in your slide, I can send you guys a little bit. And if I see you, I can give you a little chart so I'll get something out for you to put in. Okay, refrigeration using till temperature below five slows the product reproduction of the microorganisms. And who remember what microorganisms will grow in refrigeration? Remember we talked about that? Anybody, which other microorganisms does well in refrigeration? Listeria, yes. So refrigeration is no match. Thank you, Irenia, for listeria. It will grow in refrigeration and causes illness, not to most healthy people, but to pregnant women. Um, refrigeration will work, but we all know that, that we need to store the food properly. And a good habit is when you look in your refrigerator that you are storing the meat, the raw fish, everything in the bottom above your vegetable, uh, below your vegetables, because you don't want to put those raw meat on the top because they're going to provide the juice and the juice is loaded with bacteria and cross-contaminate. Um, proper storage and handling of the food. When we go grocery shopping, I see a lot of that and I that's why I think we have more foodborne poisoning in the Caribbean. I mean it's hot and the fishermen, we don't have cooling structures for the fishermen. Some of them have ice but the ice melt. And so many times I see the fish is out all day or we go out to the farm and the chicken we buy in the market, we don't have coolers for it. So when you shop, you should shop for your frozen food last. And if you can take it home quickly and refrigerate it, do not go visit the neighbors and sit around and chit chat because that's gonna be a, a source of foodborne poisoning. And even though you'll cook it, 
but then you have to think about cross-contamination. And if you have a high, high load, you might still not have enough time to cook out all the bacteria. So when you go home, if you haven't already, make sure your refrigerator is separated where your meat, if you have it in there, it's in the bottom, your vegetables in the top. And another one is you don't overstock the refrigerator because then it will prevent the air circulation to keep the food at the proper temperature. So that's chill. Um, now I have a video here. Now I think this one is the kitchen one. This one will just give you a quick, if I pass the, put the kitchen one on the nail, this is gonna give you a quick summary of kitchen hygiene. And that's taken from SSAFE. And SSAFE is an organiz, organization that works on putting trading material together. I work with them and they will do trading material for companies and just for the public. So this one is one from, yeah, at, um, from Safe Food. Take a look, take a listen. So one of the most important parts of what we do, um, especially in the kitchen, whether it's the kitchen at a hotel or your kitchen, is hand washing. So the FDA and most local health departments have guidelines. So first of all, you rinse your hands, you add soap, you scrub vigorously for 20 seconds, making sure you get in between the fingers, the nails, but scrubbing vigorously to create friction and then rinsing properly. So when I teach hand washing, the one thing that I teach my team at the South Point and my students is to never turn the knob off with your hands to recontaminate your hands, but to use the paper towel. So dealing with chicken. Um, a lot of folks like to wash their chicken. I don't particularly wash my chicken, but here's one of the myths to chicken. When you wash your chicken, you are not washing off any of the germs or bacteria. Um, that comes about, you kill bacteria by cooking this to 165 degrees um, for 15 seconds and using a properly calib calibrated thermometer to make sure that it's the right temperature. It's important to make sure that we wash the sink first of all. And keep in mind, as you're washing the sink, the surfaces that the chicken may have touched or you may have touched if you were not using gloves. So all the surfaces that the chicken touched, we wanna wash with nice soapy water and a good soap. And after you've washed the sink good with a nice soap, you want to use a sanitizer. You can use a spray sanitizer, or if you have Clorox at home, you can use Clorox. And then just let the sink dry naturally by itself. So other things to do in the kitchen um, following 
health department and FDA guidelines is washing of fruits and vegetables. Now, potatoes are one of the ones that I think you should not only wash, but you should actually scrub in the sink. And I'll show you why. So keep in mind, potatoes grow on the ground. So potatoes have dirt on them and you cooking the potato does not or does not always kill germs that might be on there. So it's important to not only wash them, but you want to scrub them. And that's why. Same with other vegetables that you may have in your garden or that you may use or buy from the store. I always use a scratch pad to try to remove as much of the outside germs. For instance, you have no idea who's handled these if their hands were clean. So you want to make sure that whatever the vegetable is that you're using, onions included, that you wash the outer skin before you cut into them with your knife because when you cut into a, a vegetable, an apple or orange, the contamination from the outside, you have now gotten on the surface on the inside. And if you're eating them raw, that's what makes you sick. So some of the other things that you can do at home um, for the different meats, you can have different color cutting boards, um, chicken, of course, red meat, vegetables, and fish. But if you don't have these handy tools at home and you're just using a cutting board, so we're going to fabricate some chicken on the board. And the most important thing is what you do with the board afterwards. You are working with salmonella typically, but it's important that we wash, we rinse and we sanitize our cutting board in between changing our task. And the same thing with our knife. So now that I've cleaned my board, I'll, I'll just cut um, some vegetables. So remembering that we've washed <clears throat> all our vegetables. So our chicken has now come out of the oven. And what's most, most important is taking a temperature. So with our calibrated thermometer, we're looking for the thickest part, which is typically the breast. So you want to stick it in there, make sure it comes to 165 degrees or better. But then you also want to look at other places like the thigh. So you don't want to just stick it in one place. You want to stick it in a couple of places just to make sure even temperature. Perfect.
Okay. So I have a few questions for you. And I'm gonna call on somebody I haven't heard from. Nadia, what did you see that he could have done better or that what went wrong? Nadia? Nadia still on? Nadia, I can see you. Nadia Kelly? Okay, no Nadia. What about Juliet? Juliet Bob? Juliet, are you there? Come on guys, I know you're there. All right, since those two people are gonna leave me hanging, Juliet and, and Nadia decide not to answer me. I'm not gonna take it personal, but anybody else see anything else in the video that based on what we learned that he did wrong? Did I lose everybody? Good evening. Hi. Hi, I found that when he was washing the vegetables, even though he had cleaned the potatoes, he continued to wash the other vegetables over that. Yes, so that was a possible source of cross-contamination. Good pick. What else? I, th I thought that he, I think I saw him washing the vegetables with the sponge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. yes I, I saw but, that too. And that's a problem because the sponge is absorbent and in between he can catch trap bacteria and germs in there, yes. What else? You guys sharp eyes. What else did you see? Hi, uh, good evening. I think he should have washed the vegetables, um, the onions and pepper after cutting them. That's true. He should have washed it after cutting them. And what else? That's beyond that. What else do you think, Anthea or anybody else, he should have done with the vegetables and the chicken? Yes, he washed it. But what else would it be a better thing to do? Well, um. He had this sponge there when he was washing the chicken, so maybe something from the chicken could have splashed on the sponge, mm -hmm. and that might have been cross contamination. I, I don't know. Yeah, I think for me, I mean, that's a chance, but I would say wash the do the vegetables first, and before you even take the chicken out, prepare the vegetables so you don't have any chance of cross contaminating. That what he did was not wrong but it gives more chance for you to get cross-contamination. What else did you see? Where was the vegetables on the table while he had the raw chicken on there? Did you guys notice the bowl of vegetables? The bowl of vegetables was mm -hmm. on the same table, even though it was separated by the sink. And remember he chopped that chicken, right? What did I say about when you chop that chicken? The little specks that you can see can go a long way. And you don't need a lot of, of um, Bacteria, remember, they cannot be seen if they're naked eyes. And one drop of chicken can have millions of bacteria and potential for you to get sick from them. Good. Do you guys notice anything else? Did you notice how we handled the cooked chicken? He wasn't wearing gloves, which it, it's a big discussion of if does glove works or does glove doesn't work. So for me, if you are going to wash, take the glove, disposable glove and throw it out, I'd prefer gloves if you're using it properly. Because even though he's washing his hands, if he has other stuff on his hands, on the cooked chicken, not on the raw ones, on the cooked chicken, if you're doing it at home, it's fine, but if you're gonna prepare it outside, I want you to use gloves on my phone, sorry. Now, glove can be very dangerous. That's one of the biggest um, audit findings when people go to audit, or if I go to find an audit place, is the improper use of gloves. And COVID happened, and I think COVID was probably one of the best things that happened for food safety because it brought awareness in that it brought awareness to how people are doing the protocols. So sometimes when you see a lot of people wearing their masks below their nose, that's just the same as wearing gloves improperly. 
And if you are using gloves and you, I see some of the roadside vendors, they have gloves, but they're touching the food, they're touching the raw chicken, they're touching everything. So it might as well don't use the glove. It's not that to protect your hands, it's to protect the bacteria from getting to the food. Okay? Good. Any good evening. questions? So I think, good evening. I was thinking about the gloves in that sometimes they use the glove to do something, take them off, and then put them back on again because they want to save. Oh, that is so disgusting. I'm telling you that, especially when they go to the bathroom. You should dispose the gloves out before you go in. And also somebody, when we look, look at the one in um, with Jerry Seinfeld, the hand washing one, the other thing we didn't mention is he didn't change his apron or his clothes, right? So it's not only did he not wash his hands, but he kept that same apron and he went to the bathroom with it and he went back and produced food, another source of contamination. He should have taken that apron off and put a disposable one on. Um, Judith said he dried his hands, but still touched the sponge while drying with a napkin, then transferred the napkin. Uh, then transferred the napkin, he turned off the tap with, yes, true. Someone in the group did mention that. That is very true. You guys can write this video yourself. All right, good job guys, thank you. All right, so the last piece I have, it's on personal hygiene. And again, it's common sense. So when we talk about personal hygiene, we're talking about for us at home, for the, our workers in the factory, it becomes so much important for, for us in the factory. Remember I mentioned that in the US or in Mexico where they have those big fields, the fields are like football size fields. And you have those workers, they're going into the field at four o'clock in the morning and they stay there the whole day, the bathroom areas are not close. So what do they do? They go in and they dig up a, a, a hole and do their business in there. They're not forming personal hygiene. They don't have place for them to change their clothes. So a lot of that personal hygiene becomes very, very critical on the farm, but it has to start at home. So if you follow in personal hygiene at home, that's one good way to do that. You wash your hands regularly, especially after using the bathroom, shower at least once a day. Um, clean clothes, again, it's important because clothes can be a carrier for transferring bacteria from one place to another. Do not prepare food when you're sick. So a lot of people is like, well, if I'm home and I have a headache, I have to prepare the food, who else is gonna cook for me? But if you are going to prepare food while you're sick, take precaution, wash, put a mask on, wash your hands regularly. And if you can avoid it, not. If you have, when we talk about farm and personal hygiene, if you have workers that's sick or coughing, again, that's another place where I say COVID helps us a lot when it comes to foodborne illness in that matter. If you don't take them out completely, make sure that your workers, if they are sick, they're not working on ready to eat food. You can put them in other areas of the farm, make them do other things that's not handling ready to eat food. And when I talk about ready to eat food on the farm, I'm talking about your produce that's not gonna get cooked. Maybe make them work in the yam or in the other plantains or other stuff if you don't have the ability to minimize the resource from people being sick coming to work. And again, from a food safety culture, make it safe for your workers to not come to work when they're sick. I know people will abuse it, but you have to also take that into consideration. Um, then we have cover any exposed cuts or wound. So with a band-aid. What do you guys think about that? The other group I had some, I had had some um, points on that. What's your take on using Band-Aid in a food processing area or even at home? Is that a good thing? Is there bad things about that? One of the things they said was the um, Band-Aid is, well, go ahead. Okay, in terms of using the Band-Aid, it is, 
good and bad because it actually helps to stem the flow of blood, right? It holds the skin together. However, it would be a best practice if they, they have some finger, um, some small things that you normally put over your finger, like mm -hmm. more plastic or rubber like thing that is yeah. better, safe, yeah. more safer. It's yeah. actually larger as well. Not only that, sometimes in, prep in the preparation of food, the bandages come off and persons don't see. And also sometimes when you're dealing with vegetables, the blood may seep through the bandage and mm -hmm. um, go onto the, the green leafy vegetables when you're doing salads and contaminate them. Just, just like Very it. well said, Joyce. And bad. Very well said. So the idea here is to, if you have, so it's, the bandage might not be the best thing, is to use a covering that is not then gonna create a problem um in your food and nobody wants to find bandit in their food um i need to tell you two things about that so it's not about that uh, do you guys have the pouch drinks where the capri sun where the kids put the straw in and they drink the juice from it but well, i used to work with general foods and we made those pouch juices and they were all natural they didn't have preservative and if you have a little hole mold will get in there and the mold will take out the color and we used to get a lot of complaints because the kids would drink the juice and then they would suck the juice from and they would pull out this most disgusting looking thing in the, the beverage. People would call it used condoms, bloody um, stuff. So, but it was coming from mold that looked like a, a used bandaid. So the moral of the story here, if you're un at that time to solve that problem, General Foods created the back of the pouch. It's clear so you can see what's in it. So when you give your kids those pouches, just be careful that it's not leaking or there's no micro holes in it because you can't see it. And after you put it in your mouth, it's disgusting. The one other thing I forgot to mention was when you use rice, we talked about microorganisms. So rice, is a big, big problem. We use a lot of rice, and especially if we have parties, we cook big pots of rice. The problem with that is if you are cooking a large quantity of rice, a big bowl of rice, it takes a long time to cool. And most of us don't think of rice as a problem that we will think about chicken. We don't refrigerate it. We keep it outside on, on our table for a long time. The problem with that is rice have spores and the spores are called bacillus cereus or B cereus. It's very common in rice. When we cook the rice, the spores by itself is not a problem, but in cooking it, what we are doing is what we call germinating the spores. So basically like a seed, you're cracking it open and then it grows and produce a toxin which then you consume and will make you sick. So when we make rice, let's make sure we either use smaller portions or we cool it quickly, because even if we heat it after, then it's still a problem. I have a personal experience with it because we went to a family wedding where everybody prepared the food. It wasn't catered, it was home prepared and Everybody, you know, when you prepare big family gatherings, everybody's cooking, they cook the rice and everybody likes rice. So when we were going home, oh, it was a long trip. It was a two bucket disease. So when we started calling, we found out everybody who had the food, we started finding out what, who ate what and who didn't eat what. So we found out the people who were sick was the rice. So we went back and the rice was brought in overnight in a big pot. It was heated, but again, it was too late. So just be careful when you make rice or other big products like that, that you are cooling it down. Okay. So and let's stop if we have any questions about what we covered so far, so we went through it quickly. We have 15 minutes. We'll do some question and answers. Or uh, get me some of your feedback of anything we didn't cover that you would like to cover in that chat. Linnell, did we have anything in the chat that I missed? 
you should put your gloves on over the Band-Aid and change the Band-Aid regularly. Yes. And make sure the glove then don't become a problem. Could you explain about the rice? Are you saying that they should have cooled the rice properly and then refrigerated and oh, then Oh, yeah. It? So the rice, they should have cooled it. The big problem was they didn't cool the rice and the rice was in a big, big container. So it kept the core temperature of the rice just in the danger zone. Remember we talked about the danger zone? And the spores that was in the rice had the time to grow and produce that toxin. So it's about, cool. you can cook your rice at normal, but make sure that you have it cooled down so it's not creating a temperature for growth. They normally call it the fried rice syndrome, but because we have to be politically correct, we can't use that anymore. And the reason they call it the fried rice syndrome is because when you make fried rice, you're making a lot of it. So it's the size is a big problem too, because it doesn't cool. If you cool it, it's not a problem. It's making sure that the center part of the rice is cooling. Does that answer your question? Yes, I, I thought that you could put food from the stove to the fridge. Is that, is that can be an issue? Can you cook and, and put your food in storage containers and just put it straight to the fridge? Um, so you have to, good question. Can you cook and put it in the fridge? So if you cook a big quantity of rice, you need to separate it out because even though you put it in the fridge, it will take too long to cool the inside part of it because by the time it goes down to the temperature at four degrees or the right temperature, the spores will already have germinated and grow. So you need to make it in smaller parcels if you're gonna refrigerate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or feedback or anything that a burning question you have that wasn't covered? Yes, hi, good night. Good night. I do a lot of meal prepping mm -hmm. and I normally cook, serve it in my containers, wait until it cools completely and then put it in the refrigerator. But um, sometimes, you know, life happens and you have got a kind of time. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and sometimes you just cook and put it in the fridge. I know you was referencing rice, but does that apply to all foods in general? They need it to cool completely before you put it in the fridge because that's what I always heard. Cool it completely before. You have about a two hour fridge. window where you can stay at room temperature. So you can cool down. You can cool it outside. Again, the bigger part of it is the size, right? Is the quantity. If you put it in smaller quantities, it cools down faster. You want to get to the temperature as fast as you can. If you put it in the bigger containers, you can't get it down. If you put it in right away again, it takes a longer time. Also, it impacts the other part of the refrigerator. It'll re raise the temperature of the refrigerator in your other food and before you bring it back down. So you have like a two hour window, but then don't put big, big, big quantities unless you have a big walk-in freezer or something that can take it, but try to cool it down. I mean, we see that all the time. We go to parties and then we don't even pay attention to it. We leave the food out for much longer than we need to. And then sometimes we don't get sick. Sometimes we get a little bit something. We say, ah, it's something I ate and we move on. And we don't have a lot of outbreaks. An outbreak is if you have reported not one person, but two or more people getting sick on the same food, it's an outbreak. In the developed countries, we have areas where with the um, all hospitals can have a test. So if I come to hospital A, you go to hospital B in a different part of the world, in minutes, they can able to do a DNA test 
and see if it's the same bacteria that's making you sick. And that has created a lot of problems. In factories, the FDA can come to your factory, do what we do. It's um, how many people, let me step, go back. How many people are doing agro-processing? Show of hands. Is anybody in here doing agro-processing? We won't cover a lot of agro-processing. We'll fo focus mostly on farm, but anybody have manufacturing where you produce juice or other food, canned foods? Oh, nobody? Okay, but we, have you guys heard of environmental monitoring? Oh, it started today. What? Okay. Oh, sorry, this is not for you. Okay. So um, in, when we talk about the factories, if we talk about it, one of the things I have not seen us do in the Caribbean, and you guys can correct me, in the manufacturing facility, is what I call environmental monitoring. So where you go, you take the swab of your facility, the surface, to see if you have any bacteria in there. And that's one way to do your safety of your food, especially if you're finding it on your product contact surfaces. But we don't do enough of that in the Caribbean as yet. But in the places where they do it, they can find that organism. And even though they don't find it, they can link it. They come to your facility, swab it, identify it, and put it in the database. And if they are able to link it to a foodborne disease, then they will shut you down. So environmental monitoring, there's a lot of technology out there that can help. We're not there yet, but it's something for us to think about. Okay, any other questions? Feedback? Yes, in terms, just final question. Good evening, everyone again. In right. terms of food poisoning, I find that um, when you go to the hospital, they, they ask you what you last ate. Yeah. If it's a combination of stuff, they will eliminate them and tend to focus on, say, fish. Mm -hmm. they, they tend to, so if it's more than different things you eat, they will be like, okay, you have food poisoning from fish. Yeah. Why, why is fish at the top of the pyramid? Um, now, is that for St. Kitts Nevis or everywhere else? St. Kitts Nevis. Yeah, because fish is more sensitive, it's a high risk. Remember I said also, when we pro process fish, we don't put it on ice fast enough. That's the only reason I can think. It's not any more dangerous than eating um, half cooked chicken or cross contaminated vegetable. But because of the sensitivity of the fish, the physicians probably are going to say it's fish. And remember I said, if you get foodborne poisoning, it necessarily not the last thing you ate, remember? If you have- Yes, but, but when you take, when they take, when they do the intake interview, they do not ask you what you ate prior. They always ask you what you just ate. And so we have some more work to do in that area, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's sad that our physicians are, are doing that because they're missing out on what's really causing it to sick. It could have been something you ate 24 hours ago or sometimes 48 hours it will take before you can get sick. So most of the time it takes you, even if it's an intoxication, you need about four hours. You can get zero to four hours but most of the time it's not the thing you eat the last time. So misdiagnosing them, poor fish is getting all the, all the blame for it. They had to write something on the form. <laughs> they do, right? Yes, so indeed. We have, some work, we have some work to do. But now you can yes. tell them the next time, you know, hey, I ate this thing, but there was also this other stuff I ate before, or I went to this party. It's very hard to diagnose it. And that's one thing we don't have a good grasp on in the Caribbean to be able to diagnose and go back and pinpoint where the problem is. You should right. visit us. <laughs> what? You should visit St. Kitts. I will, that's the plan. When COVID puts us down, I'd love to come and visit. I wanna go to Marquis Farm. 
as Marky tell me, his inward farm is A1. So I saw some nice cucumbers from his plant. So I plan to go over there when the COVID is over. So I'm going to come visit you guys. All right. See you when you get here. Bye. All right. So <laughs> let's do a quick, um, Lanelle, did we have any, of the, any more of the Jeopardy questions? Oh, that was it. I have a question before we go to Jeopardy. OK. Um, OK. I don't know how much it applies to the, the whole topic that we're dealing with, but um, it came to my mind. I'm wondering um, about uh, the impacts of consuming um, foods that are past expiration date. Hmm. So that's a good question. We didn't touch on it. And we'll talk about labeling. Hopefully when we do nutrition, we'll talk about that. So okay. food that's past nutrition, the labels, is normally not gonna be because of bacteria or from a pathogen. The expiration dates are mostly for quality, right? So the quality of the food might deter deteriorate, the nutrition value might be lowered, but the majority of the time when food expired, expired, it's because of quality, not foodborne illness. And the countries are now changing front of back label and they are changing the ex, um, expired date to best used by, if you notice that. So use yes. some food that have best used by, that means nothing to you. It's the same thing. That means you can still use it, but when, can, when the stores buy it, like the big stores buy the food, if they have best use by, they can turn it around faster. So they're not having a lot of loss on it. Right. So expiration date for food, you can most, unless it's milk and it's not sour, they have a few more days before they really spoil, but they won't make you sick necessarily, except if you have a dented can. Okay, thank you, understood. Yeah, somebody, let me see what's in the chat. The, you said that the food after the best buy day depends on the item. That is true. If it's open or unopened, keep the fridge or freezer kept in the fridge or freezer. Yeah, that's true too. If you have like I buy food at Costco in big quantities and I freeze them, so that best use buy they don't mean anything. But again, like I said, it is not about pathogen most of the time. It's about spoilage. I'm <laughs> All right, any more questions, guys? This has been, for me, it's been really interactive and I really appreciate all of you taking the time and making this experience exciting because it's hard when I can't see you guys. So I really appreciate the participation. I hope you guys took something away from it as well. Tomorrow, let's go to the next slide, Lanel. Uh, go to the one after that. So tomorrow we'll be covering good agricultural practices. We'll do produce safety, organic farming and certification. So what I would like for you guys to do in preparation for tomorrow is you guys got a journal, right? Lanelle, they have the journal? No. Lanelle? Lanelle? You guys didn't get a journal in your um, online? Oh, yes, sir. yes we did. Yes, yes, the, yes we they did, all received but, it. Yes, we did, but we may not be using it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew you guys might not use it, but what I want you to do tomorrow is take a look at it and do some thinking on it, on your farm assessment and your food safety plan, if it applies to you. I know if you have a backyard garden, it wouldn't make that much sense, but you can still practice. And then when we do the gap and tomorrow's exercise, you can have some of the information to fill in as we go or for when you go back on it. So we'll go through the forms a little bit, say what they mean, and then you can use them to start populating it, okay? So take a look at that for tomorrow. We'll go through that. Okay, we are out of time. So we can either do a couple more um, Jeopardy questions or we can say goodbye. I know you guys had a long day. Kindly show the 
slide just before this last one. I'd appreciate that, please. Okay, so that, that's the agenda for tomorrow. Yes. Okay, and did we get two volunteers to do a summary for us, Linnell? Did we get okay. two volunteers? Any volunteers or do I have to call on some person? Okay, well, I guess I will choose some persons at random. How about Glencia Saunders? I think that's the name. And Lenise Freeman. All right, guys. And again, it's a quick summary about what we went through. It's not anything, you don't have to spend a lot of time to do a paper on it. Just a quick summary of what you got from it. Okay, just to help us refresh our minds. You can use your Jeopardy um, table if you have it to help you. Okay, guys, I really appreciate it. And again, I'll see you tomorrow. And looking forward for another two hours. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. Good night. Practice good night. your safety at home. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, good night, everyone. And thank you. You're welcome, my dear. Good night. Bye. Um, good night. Wait. Um, my internet is giving trouble. Why? I I'm heard still... my name, but I didn't I didn't understand why she called <laughs> my name. Sorry. You got volunteered to do a summary tomorrow for the class. But from this class? Yeah, for today, just do a quick summary tomorrow of what we learned. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you.